Hello and welcome back to my podcast. At the top, as per usual, I want to remind everybody to subscribe, rate, comment. I'm on iTunes, I'm on Google Play, and I'm on Stitcher. Go ahead and subscribe. That way you don't have to remember and I just magically show up in your phone and you don't have to remember to go find me. Now that that's out of the way, can we talk about this week in Second Amendment? I mean, holy hell has this been a week for 2A. If you would have told me last Thursday that the least interesting thing that would happen over the next week is the March for Our Lives, I would have told you, no, that's that's insane. But then the internet decided to tell the March for Our Lives, hold my drink because we're going in. But we might as well go ahead and start at the beginning, which is the March for Our Lives. Happened last Saturday. Um, overall, I really don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with these kids and, well what actually ended up being mostly adults mixed in with some kids, going out and expressing their First Amendment rights. I have no problems with free speech. I have no problems with peaceful assembly. I don't have an issue with the march itself. What I do have an issue with, and I'm starting to notice a lot of other people kind of reaching the breaking point on this one, is this kind of clown nose on, clown nose off again thing of teaching, treating these children as either children or as adults. It's they're kind of playing this little game where you want to hold these kids out here as being somebody that you should listen to as something of a moral compass as serious people. But then the second you want to criticize someone, all of a sudden they're children again and you can't criticize them. And it's, it's either got to be A or B. If you want me to take you seriously, then I will take you seriously, but I will also criticize you seriously. You can't keep kind of playing this back and forth game. It's you pick one. It's all math. You just pick one. Stick with it. Either they're children who can't be criticized and need to be protected, or they're adults who should be taken seriously and therefore open themselves up to criticism the same way any of us that enter the political arena do. On the topic of kids, something that I saw that did really bother me too is seeing young kids, I mean like, you know, seven, eight, nine year olds out here with signs protesting for gun control, which first of all, children that young do not and should not have an opinion on this. It's your parents that have an opinion and you're, they're giving you a sign, which if you're an adult and you're taking your child and you're using them as a human shield to express your opinions, what the fuck is wrong with you? If you're an adult, express your opinions. You don't have to use your child to do that for you. Second of all, if you do this, you put your child out there with a sign, you know somebody's going to take a picture and your baby's going to get roasted on the internet. Why would you do that to your baby? Why would you put them in that position? You know somebody's going to have some shit to say about it. Why would you do that to your child? It's not very inspiring or uplifting to watch adults use children as human shields. Also, there was a lot of things said at the March for Our Lives that I know it's supposed to be a quote-unquote gun control rally, but it really tiptoed an awful close bit to gun confiscation rally. There was one speaker that said that if they give us an inch with the bump stocks, we will end up taking a mile, which we'll kind of go into that later because the internet kind of went completely, completely off the wall with this idea to where we got to, let's repeal the Second Amendment, but we'll, we'll get there as things progress. Overall, I'm pretty meh on the march. I mean, okay, it happened. You're not the first people to march for gun control. You won't be the last. I highly doubt this is going to have any effect on policy, which I wonder how these kids are going to start feeling when they start realizing that this isn't going to have the effect that they're going for. I mean, do you keep going? Do you stop? Do you change tactics? I'm really curious to see what is going to happen, especially to the David Hoags and the Emma Gonzalez's of the world when you realize all those speeches and all those tears don't really affect anything when it comes right down to it. Anyway, moving on to something more interesting that happened Saturday, and that is the NRA TV Killer Mike Coolion the War interview that just completely blew up on Saturday. Like this story got legs that I did not expect it to get. Um, basically, I had watched this video the Friday before. And I don't know exactly how it ended up going so wide on Saturday, but it did. And everybody wanted to come out of the woodwork to tell Killer Mike about how, 
oh, you shouldn't have talked to the NRA. You shouldn't have done this interview. You played yourself. You shouldn't be talking to them. You shouldn't be going on their platform, which I'm going to need everybody who got on Twitter and came at this dude telling him who he can and cannot speak to to go hand in your woke card. Because telling a black man who he can and cannot speak to isn't very woke. So like I said, I had actually watched the whole noir episode, basically calling on noir if you don't know. He has his own NRA TV TV show, for lack of a better word. I mean, obviously it's not on TV, it's on YouTube. But basically it's his own little show and this interview was a segment on the show. So obviously what was shown originally was edited. And I'd watched it that Friday night and I didn't really think much of it as far as it being offensive or anything. I actually do enjoy Killer Mike. I'm a fan of his. And I really like listening to him speak on Second Amendment issues, especially as a black man, because he comes at it from a different perspective than what I do as a white woman. And I find it interesting to hear somebody else who's advocating for the same things that I advocate for, but from a different perspective. I think there is something to that, and it is something to think about when you are advocating for your Second Amendment rights, that other people that are in the same fight as you may have a different perspective, and it is worth listening to. The thing that really bothered me about people coming after him on that on Saturday was you could tell by the criticisms that were being launched at him and the tone that the people who were coming after him for going on NRA TV had not even bothered to stop and actually watch the interview and hear what he had to say, which how the fuck are you going to tell somebody what platform they can go on when you're not even willing to give that person five minutes of your time to actually listen to what the hell he had to say in the interview? That's rude. And it's also why we can't have nice things like dialogues, because all of a sudden, just because somebody went on a platform that you don't approve of, you want to shut them down, which that's not how you maintain a conversation. That's not how you start a dialogue. If you just go on the little places that you approve of and you know that everybody's going to agree with you, well, have fun in your echo chamber. I get it. It's nice to talk and have people agree with you and give you thumbs up and likes and retweets and just boost you for that but don't ever think that by doing that you're actually helping anything or that you're advancing an argument or a dialogue because if you're only ever talking to people that you agree with and you only ever go on platforms that you approve of you're not going to advance anything like a dialogue you're not going to have a conversation with people in order to do something in order to affect something to make a difference you have to go talk to people that you don't agree with and Mike has been very open about saying that he does not agree with everything that the NRA stands for. But you do have to at least attempt to talk to people because if, if that's your position, if you don't like the NRA and you don't like what they stand for, that's fine. And if you don't feel like they represent you, well, shutting them down and not engaging is not going to fix that problem. It's only going to exacerbate it. So anyway, after about two days of people coming after him for doing this interview, Mike issued an apology, basically saying that he's sorry that, not for anything that he said, but for, he kind of has this feeling like the NRA did this kind of on purpose somehow. Like they kind of used this to kind of do a subtle dig at the March for Our Lives kids, which I don't know if I thoroughly buy into that. I'm not a big fan of correlation being causation, and for me to buy into that, it would require me to believe that the NRA is able of throwing much more subtle shade than they normally do. Usually the NRA, when they want to say something, they just outright say it. I mean, this is the organization that made an ad protesting fake news by having a guy throw a sledgehammer at a television. Subtlety isn't really their strong suit, so I, absent any evidence that that was their intent, I'm not going to ascribe that to them. I think it was just just coincidence, honestly. And actually, it was released not that Saturday, but it was released released the Thursday before. So, like I said, I don't I don't put that on the NRA. I don't really feel like that's what they were trying to do. So, honestly, I don't think Mike really had anything to apologize for, but he's a grown man. He can say whatever he wants on whatever platform he wants. That's his business. So I thought, okay, apology, that's the end of the story. 
Nope. Because on Tuesday, Colian Noir released on his YouTube channel the full unedited version of the interview, which clocks in at a little over 40 minutes. And I will post the link in the show notes because it is such a good interview. I highly recommend everybody go watch this interview. Go listen to what the man has to say because he makes some very good, very valid points that do need to be made. Obviously, he and Colian Noir discuss what it is like to be black gun owners, to be black men who are pro 2A. And there's a very, very interesting conversation on the topic of allies and who is your ally and where are your allies when you need them? Because all of a sudden, whenever something like this happens, you have a gun control rally, you have this, you have that, whatever. You want black people to turn out, but then all of a sudden when somebody wants to have a Black Lives Matter rally or you want to have a discussion about the 13th Amendment, these people are nowhere to be found. So really, what is an ally? Are these people your allies? And Mike even goes on to make the point in the interview that if you do feel like the NRA doesn't represent you, then go flood their ranks. Go sign up. Go make your voice heard so that they can know what your position is and maybe start to represent you as opposed to holding yourself back and not engaging because that's, that, like I said, that's not going to get your voice heard. So after that video blew up, and it's still kind of blowing up, it's Thursday, and I'm still seeing people tweeting out links to the full interview, I thought, okay, all right, that's, that's enough to weigh for this week. Nope. Because former Justice John Paul Stevens, he used to be a SCOTUS judge, comes in from the high dive board and swan dives all the way into this conversation with an op-ed from the New York Times saying, let's repeal the Second Amendment, which, no, let's not do that. But, of course, this opened the floodgates, and now everybody and their mama wants to post an op-ed about repealing the Second Amendment. And basically, that has started to happen. And I'm, I for one, I'm glad to have this conversation. I'm glad to hear people finally just say that that's what they want, because that's an argument that can be won based off of facts and logic. And if you're in need of an argument, I will give you one. And we'll actually start off with what former Justice Stevens had to say, which is that repealing the Second Amendment would be simple, which Yes, it would be simple. It's not a difficult process. You're looking at probably about four steps. Simple does not equal easy. All right, so here would be the process of introducing a constitutional amendment, which basically we say repealing an amendment. You don't really repeal amendments. You add an amendment that makes another amendment null and void. It's kind of why we don't go from the 17th to the 19th Amendment. We still have the 18th. We just introduced another amendment to void that amendment. So what you do, you get a senator. Actually, you'd probably get a congressperson. You'd probably start in the House. A congressperson, a group of congresspeople. And they say, hey, we would like to propose a constitutional amendment. Okay, so you hold a vote. Here's the requirements. You have to have a two-thirds vote in the House of Representatives, a two-thirds vote in the Senate, and then two-thirds of the state have to ratify it after that. So basically you have a House vote, you have the Senate vote, and then after that they kick it out to the states and then the states do their own ratification process. So here's the argument. First off, I would like a round of applause because I did math for you guys. And I don't do math for just anybody. But here we go. The math. As it stands right now, the House of Representatives has 435 members. Two-thirds of 435 is 290. Obviously, the Senate has 100 members. Two-thirds of 100 is 67. I included Puerto Rico in this when I was counting states, so I'm at 51. I couldn't really find one way or another whether they would be eligible to vote for this or not, but... I like you, Puerto Rico. I think you should get a vote in this, so I put you in there. So two-thirds of 51 is 34. So here's the numbers. Here's how this would have to break down in order for this to become 
a constitutional amendment. You would have to have a House vote of 290 to 145. Now, just for comparison, I know we don't normally talk about House supermajorities because it never happens, but if there was such a thing as a House supermajority, you would need 29 votes over the supermajority vote to get to that. In the Senate, the vote would have to be 67 to 33. Obviously, that's seven votes over a supermajority vote. And then for states, you would have to get 34 to 17 ratification for this to become a constitutional amendment. This math don't work. This Congress certainly is not going to get those numbers. I don't see any Congress going forward getting those numbers. And even if you did that, you are not going to get those state numbers to that. It's just the math is not there. Logistically, this isn't possible. Therefore, it's not going to happen. Therefore, can we please stop having this discussion? With this argument, you don't have to make the emotional argument. You don't have to make the ethical argument. You don't have to make the moral argument. It's just basic math. There is no way that the Second Amendment is going to get repealed. That's it. There's, that's it. That's the end of the conversation. So all that brings us up to today, which so far today, nothing else 2A related has popped off. I just checked my Twitter timeline just to make sure I'm not missing anything. So basically, to recap everything, March for Our Lives, kids. Politics ain't beanbag. If you're going to step into the ring, you better be ready to get punched. Killer Mike, you didn't have nothing to apologize for, dude. And I'm sorry that shit happened to you. You didn't deserve that. Repeal 2A, people. Go sit the fuck down, because it ain't happening. So stop. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. I just want to remind you again, if you like this, please subscribe. I'm on iTunes. I'm on Google. I'm on Stitcher. Rate. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Thank you, and until next time.